Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel and welcome to the final video in our Creep Week series where we discuss some of the creepiest cases out there in the spirit of Halloween. This is part two in the dating game serial killer series, so if you haven't seen part one, make sure you go ahead and watch part one before diving in to part two. In part one, we discussed Rodney Akala, who he is, his life growing up, his initial victims, as well as how he got the name the dating game killer. In this part, we will be discussing the remainder of his victims, how he got caught, and the mess of trials that took place as a result. But before we get into today's case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Babbel. I've been using Babbel for a few weeks now and it's been so helpful in helping me learn Spanish again. I did take Spanish in high school, but the minute I graduate, I forgot pretty much everything. And I really enjoy traveling. I like going to Mexico. I've been to Costa Rica and places like that. I also work in healthcare and I live in Arizona. So knowing Spanish is a very important skill for me to have. Whether it's speaking to people while I'm traveling and getting directions or getting help from somebody who only speaks Spanish, or being able to speak with Spanish-speaking patients, knowing Spanish is such an important skill for me when I like to travel and in my everyday job. Babbel is great because they teach you real-world practical conversations through short 10-minute interactive lessons. And their lessons are designed by language teachers and not by AI. They also use speech recognition, which is a really cool feature that is really helpful for me because I have trouble pronouncing a lot of different things, so having that feedback is is really important to me. Mis padres son profesores. ¿Quién eres? Yo soy Claudia. Ever since starting Babbel several weeks ago, I feel like I have so much of a greater ability to be able to connect with my Spanish-speaking patients. It's so nice to be able to understand what they're trying to tell me and they know that I'm listening versus them feeling like I might not be getting all of the important information that they're telling me. It's also super helpful when I'm traveling. I just got back from Mexico a couple of weeks ago and knowing how to understand Spanish at least has been so helpful in checking into hotels and getting directions and finding different activities to do. There's a reason why Babbel is the number one language learning app and it's because their lessons are so easy to navigate. They also use award-winning technology proven to get you speaking in just three weeks. Start speaking a new language in just three weeks with Babbel. You can get up to 65% off of your subscription when you use my link down below or when you scan the QR code shown here. Let me know in the comments what language you want to start speaking and why. Once again, use my link down below or scan the QR code shown here and you can get 65% off of your subscription. Thank you again so much to Babbel for partnering with me on today's video. So in the first part of this video, we discussed Rodney's first known crime, which was an attack against an eight-year-old little girl named Tally Shapiro in 1968. Then we discussed the timeline of his other victims up until he was accepted onto the dating game show in 1978. During this time, he attacked seven victims, two of which survived. He served time in jail, of course, but somehow he was always able to find some way to spend the least amount of time in jail as possible before being released and returning to doing exactly what he was doing before. So with that being said, let's get into part two of the dating game serial killer case. By February 13th of 1979, Rodney noticed a 15-year-old girl named Monique Hoyt hitchhiking on the side of the road in downtown Pasadena, California. Of course, Rodney stopped and he told her that he was a professional photographer and he wanted her to model for him so he could take pictures of her. She saw that he had a bunch of professional photography equipment in the back of his car, so she thought he was legit. So she hopped in his car and he told her that his name was Rodney Alcala. He told Monique that they needed to stop at his house to get more photography equipment, but by the time they got there, it had gotten too dark to take the photos. So she ended up spending the night at his house. Now, I don't know a lot about what occurred that night, but what we do know is that the next morning, they drove out to the mountains outside of Banning in Riverside County, about 75 miles away from LA. When they got there, 
there, they walked about 15 minutes into the forest before Rodney said that this was a great spot to stop and take the pictures. He started by taking normal pictures of her, but about 15 minutes in, he asked her to pose nude and she did. Then after that, he told her that he wanted some goofy photos. So he told her to put her shirt above her face and take the picture like that. But when she did so, she was hit in the head and she fell to the ground. When she fell, she realized that Rodney had just hit her in the back of her head with a large tree branch. She briefly lost consciousness, but when she came to, she realized that she needed to stay calm and she needed to pretend to be unconscious or passed out while trying to think of a way to escape. She lay there as Rodney started to sexually abuse and rape her but it got to the point where she just no longer could pretend to just be unconscious anymore. She started to scream and fight until Rodney shoved her clothes in her mouth and then choked her until she passed out again. When she woke up, she found herself with her wrists and her ankles tied and she was obviously still in the woods. She had no idea how long she had been out for, but when she looked around, she noticed that Rodney was laying there crying. He was laying on the ground next to her and he was clearly upset about something. So she used this as an opportunity to take advantage of his mental state and act friendly towards him and try to gain his trust. Monique told Rodney that she wanted to spend more time with him. She rolled over to face him and then touched him and asked him if he was okay. He didn't say anything, so she asked him if she could come back to his house so that they could spend the night together. So it worked. He got up and he untied her. He put her clothes back on and the two got back into his car. Then they started driving back to his place and the entire car ride was just completely silent. After driving for a bit, they stopped at the gas station and Rodney said that he needed to use the bathroom. So he went inside and she told him that she was going to wait for him. But of course, as soon as he left, she booked it out of that car. She ran over to a motel that was right next to the gas station. She asked them if they could call the police, stating that a man had just kidnapped and raped her. One guest did call 911 while another couple that was staying there took her into their room while she waited for police to arrive. But Rodney noticed what was happening very quickly, so he got into his car and drove back to his place before police even got to the motel. Monique told the police what happened and when they showed her a photo lineup, she immediately identified Rodney as being the man who had kidnapped and raped her. So police paid Rodney a visit where he was at home and just casually watching TV. When he was unable to provide an alibi for the time that this happened to Monique, police took him in for questioning. Of course, he told police that Monique agreed to be tied up, she agreed to be photographed, and that she agreed to perform sexual acts with him. But he said that completely out of nowhere, for no reason, she just started screaming. So that is when he stuffed a t-shirt into her mouth to get her to be quiet. But police was not buying it, so Rodney was arrested for sexual assault. But a few days later, when he stood in front of a judge for his bail hearing, his bail was set at $10,000 and his mom posted his bail. She truly believed that he was innocent. So once again, he was released and he was now living his life once again as a free man as he waited for his trial, which was set for September of that year. During that same time, Rodney decided to quit his job at the LA Times and he opened up his own photography studio. During this time, he had also met a 22-year-old girl named Beth Kelher in the spring of 1979, and the two began dating. Beth described Rodney as an intelligent, well-mannered, pleasant, and fun man, and she said that she loved him. They seemed to have similar interests, including photography. However, as you can expect, Rodney did not stop committing crimes after this. Once again, he just continued learning that he wasn't going to get in trouble for the murders that he was committing, only the victims who escaped. So he needed to make sure that none of his victims would ever get away from him ever again. Jill Parentu was a 21-year-old computer programmer, key punch operator who is described as being smart, funny, and with a beautiful smile. She was also shy and reserved around those who she didn't know too well. 
She had recently turned 21 in the summer of 1979, and she was so very excited about moving out on her own. That summer, Jill and one of her best friends, Catherine, went to the Handlebar Saloon in Pasadena to hang out. This was a bar that Rodney would go to frequently, and that night, the two girls actually spoke with him. They spoke very briefly, but this interaction didn't really stand out to them, and they didn't think much of Rodney. But Jill was so excited because she had planned a date with another boy. She had told her sister, Dee Dee, as well as her friend, Catherine, about it. On June 13th, 1979, he was going to take her to a Dodgers baseball game. The two went, and it was a close game, but the Dodgers won by one point, so Jill was so excited. She was a huge fan, and it seemed like she had the best time that night. That same evening, Dee Dee called Jill to ask her how the date went, but she did not answer this phone call. That next morning, Catherine was also expecting to hear from Jill about how her date went, but once again, she didn't hear from her. Kathy continued to call Jill all throughout the day, but all of her calls were going unanswered, so she decided to call one of Jill's co-workers, Janet. Janet also hadn't seen or heard from Jill all day, and she was very concerned about her well-being at this point, so Janet headed over to Jill's house to check in on her. She knocked on the door, but she got no answer, so at this point, she was absolutely panicked. She called the police to do a welfare check, and police arrived shortly after. When they got there, they found Janet, who was absolutely absolutely hysterical and inconsolable. They entered the apartment and they immediately noticed that a screen on the window had been cut and removed and then the light bulb on the outside of the apartment had also been unscrewed. When they went into the apartment, they found the baseball program from the Dodgers game sitting on the kitchen table as well as Jill's purse. However, once they entered Jill's bedroom, they found a woman laying nude on the bed face up. She had suffered severe trauma to her head and her face. The blanket, sheets, and a nearby robe were all covered in blood. They found that she had been laying on a heated blanket, but the cord of the heated blanket was wrapped around her neck. She had severe lacerations to her head, blunt force trauma to the head, and severe hemorrhaging in her neck structures. She had also been brutally raped. Then it wasn't long after Jill's murder that another young girl's life was taken from her. Robin Samso was born December 13th, 1966. 12-year-old Robin was known as a fun-loving little girl who enjoyed doing cartwheels and back walkovers, and she just enjoyed being outside and playing with her friends. She had been taking ballet lessons for about a year at that point, and her teacher described her as being very talented. However, unfortunately, by April of 1979, her mother had gotten into a pretty severe car accident, and she had a lot of medical expenses because of it, so she could no longer afford to pay for Robin. Robin's ballet lessons. However, the owner of the studio, she saw Robin's potential and she wanted her to keep dancing. So she offered to give Robin a job there where she would be answering phones in exchange for free dance lessons. So her first day of work was set for June 20th, 1979. However, before going to work, she went over to her best friend Bridget's house to play with her for a while. That afternoon, the girls left Bridget's family's apartment and headed towards Huntington Beach, which is just across the Pacific Coast Highway. As they were walking, a tall man with dark hair dressed in a plaid shirt and slacks wearing a large camera around his neck approached the girls. He asked them if he could take their pictures, saying that he was a photographer he said that he was in a photo contest and that the girls were just so pretty that he wanted them to be in the pictures. And they agreed. He started taking photos of the girls when all of a sudden, one of Bridget's neighbors, Jackie, went over to them and asked the girls what they were up to. Instead of coming up with some sort of excuse or explanation, the man just left without saying anything. Once the man was gone, Jackie told the girls that they should not be letting strange men take pictures of them. She then walked the girls back to Bridget's apartment and then Jackie returned to her own home. Once they got back, Robin grabbed her stuff and she said that she needed to head out 
out so that she wasn't late for her first day of work. She asked Bridget if she could borrow her bike, saying that she would return her bike the next day. Robin left on the bike and then rode to her own home to pick up her dancing stuff and then started heading towards the dance studio. However, by 3, 3.30 p.m. that same day, when Robin was supposed to be at dance, Robin's teacher called her parents to tell them that she hadn't shown up to dance. Her parents were immediately concerned, so they called 911 to report Robin as a missing person. For the following hours, Robin's family went outside and searched around anywhere that they could think of in hopes of finding Robin. Police started questioning everybody that they could around the area to find out more about the situation, including Bridget, of course, and she actually gave the police the description of the man who had been taking pictures of them. But there were other witnesses who came forward to police to tell them what they had saw that day as well. First, there was another man who spotted the dark-haired man on the beach that day. The witness was also a photographer, so he stopped to talk to the dark-haired man because he noticed the camera equipment that he had, so the two had a conversation about that. Then, around the same time, there was a woman named Dana Crappa who was driving on a very narrow, windy road called Santa Anita Canyon Road, where she worked at the forestry base camp in the San Gabriel Mountains. At around 5 p.m. that same day, days, so on June 20th, she had passed a 1976 Ford Datsun F10 station wagon parked on the side of that road. This car caught her attention and she remembered it very vividly because she owned the same type of car. Obviously, on these very windy roads, you have to go very slow when you're passing someone, so she passed this car and she noticed that inside of the car, there was a dark-haired man sitting in the driver's seat as well as a blonde little girl sitting in the passenger seat. This man had intensely watched Dana as she passed and that really gave her a bad feeling. But she continued driving because again, you really have to concentrate on these types of roads. I've driven on them before. They are intense and if you stop looking at the road for even a minute, you are putting yourself in danger. So she was really concentrated on just getting to where she needed to be even though she did have this little bit of a bad feeling. The next day, Dana was driving back on these roads when she noticed the same car parked on the side of the road again, but this time it was in a different spot than where she had seen it the previous day. As she passed him, this time going in the opposite direction, she looked in her rearview mirror and once again saw the same dark-haired man. But this time, she noticed that the man looked very dirty. She also noticed that his car also looked visibly more dirty and there was mud all stuck up in his tires and underneath his car. In the days that followed, Dana went back to the location where she originally saw the car because she just did not have a good feeling about what she had seen. So she got out of the car and started walking around the path near that car. And this is where she saw a set of bones that were laying on the ground. Nearby, she had also seen, I believe, a shoe as well as some other items of clothing. But after seeing this, she didn't say anything. She just drove back home. Then the day after, she drove back to where she saw those remains. And again, she saw the bones just laying on the ground and she really inspected them. And she just had a feeling that they did not belong to animals because once again, she did see see other items near the remains, but this time, still, once again, she did not say anything. It wasn't until July 2nd when another forestry worker, William Popke, had been in the same area and he also noticed that there were human bones laying on the ground. He did call the police and they arrived shortly after to examine the scene. Of course, they sent off those remains to the medical examiner for an identification of the body. And of course, these remains did belong to 12-year-old Robin Samso. However, the remains were so decomposed at that point that they were not able to determine a cause of death. Going back just a few days on June 23rd, police released a sketch of the man that witnesses had seen on the beach with Robin on the day that she went missing. He was being stated as a suspect in this little girl's disappearance. By June 26th, police received a phone call from a man named Donald Haynes. If you remember from part one, this is the man that we discussed at the very very beginning of the video who saw Rodney pick up Tally and followed them to his apartment. This was way back in 1968, 
but he told the police that the description of this man of this sketch that he saw on tv looked very similar to the man that he saw with tally way back 10 years prior he knew that this man was rodney alcala days passed and by july 25th of 1979 detectives on robin's case decided that they finally had enough evidence to make an arrest against rodney they realized that he was out on bail for the kidnapping and rape of monique that took place in Riverside at the time. They also realized that he had no alibi for the time that Robin was murdered. The more they found, the more they realized that he fit the bill for the man that they were looking for. By 7 a.m. that same day, police arrived to Rodney's mother's house to arrest him. They did catch him by surprise because he was still laying in bed naked at the time. So they told him to get up, get dressed, and they wanted him to come in for an interview. Even though Ronnie told them that he did have an alibi, he said that he was applying for a job at the time, police did not buy it. They booked him into jail and they charged him with murder and his bail was set to $250,000. So he was not getting out on bail anytime soon. While awaiting in jail, police went through Rodney's mother's house as well as his car to search for evidence. The evidence that they found in the home is as follows. One pair of Japanese made handcuffs, boxes of photos, envelopes containing mail, pieces of rope, eight magazines, young and naked, two black photo binders, plastic slide 35 millimeter tray and slide one frizzy black wig one leather bull whip one pair of pink panties with black tape on each side one short sleeve plaid men's shirt one pair of blue nba running shorts camera equipment a briefcase containing a set of keys an additional 1200 photos negatives and slides a cane cut knife set was discovered in the house but no knife was missing from the set then the evidence collected from the datsun include binoculars photography equipment maps a 35 millimeter camera with a colorful strap and a recently installed shag carpet in addition to these items police found a receipt for a storage locker that rod had purchased in Seattle, Washington. Then police also found the keys to the storage locker within the home. So of course, police went to the storage locker and it took them three hours to search the entire thing, but they ended up finding the following items. Wintry weather clothing, kitchenware, a red coin purse, several earrings in a jewelry pouch, including a pair of gold rose earrings with a tiny diamond in the middle and a pair of gold ball earrings. On August 1st, these earrings were established to belong to victim Robin Samso. Boxes containing over 1,700 photographs, negatives, film, and slides, including one marked Tally VA tape and another labeled Ode to New York by John Berger. After finding these items, police realized that they finally had more than enough evidence to charge Rodney with several counts. The arraignment for these charges took place on July 29th, 1979, two days after the storage locker search. They charged him with kidnapping, lewd or lascivious act upon a child under 14, murder, and robbery. Rodney pled not guilty to all charges and the judge declared that he would be held without bail. Finally, by February of 1980, about a year after Robin's murder, Rodney's trial started. The prosecutor for this trial was Richard Farnell. He argued that they had a star witness, Dana Crappa, who could identify Rodney as a man seen with the young girl in the area where her remains would be found 12 days later. He talked about other witnesses who could place Rodney at the beach and taking photos of young girls on the same day that Robin went missing. Rodney's defense attorney was John Barnett. He started by saying that Dana is not a star witness and that her testimony should not be believed at all. Now, I do want to mention that in the weeks after Dana found these remains, Remember, once again, she did not tell anybody. It wasn't until William, another forestry worker, found these remains that police were finally alerted. In the weeks following this, Dana had quit work at the forestry base camp and she started college. While in college, she got close to one professor in particular and she confided in him, asking him if it was a crime, if she discovered a crime and didn't report it. But that professor encouraged her to talk to somebody about what she knew 
and that professor set up a meeting with someone so that she could tell them. Now, at the time, she did not know that this person was a cop that she was talking to, but it was. She gave multiple statements, and across these different statements, she gave varying accounts of what she saw. She gave police a couple of days that she could have seen Rodney's car, but then she was able to narrow it down to the time that she was there on June 20th. Then she initially said that she didn't know if there was a little girl with the dark-haired man that she saw, but then she changed her story and later said that she did see a blonde little girl with the man in the woods next to that guy's car. In the weeks after discovering the remains, she had multiple nervous breakdowns about the entire situation and she had been suicidal at one point. So, going back to John Barnett, he claimed at the trial that she was not credible because he claimed that the only reason that she was testifying was because she wanted police off of her back and she wanted the prosecution to stop harassing her. When Dana took the stand, she described everything that I mentioned earlier about how she remembered the day that she saw this dark-haired man and this blonde little girl in the car. She also talked about the day that she found Robin's body, how she didn't report it at first, and that she kept going back and forth. When she was cross-examined, of course, she was asked why she didn't say anything when she discovered these remains. Again, it was kind of obvious that they belonged to a human. There were clothes clothes nearby. I don't know the exact condition of the remains, but according to what, you know, William seemed to think, it did seem like it was pretty obvious that these remains did belong to a human and a little human at that. So when she was asked this, Dana basically said that she was so shocked and horrified by what she found that she didn't even know if it was real. She wanted to be sure in herself that she had just found human remains before she called the police or talked to anybody about her story. She said that she deep down knew that they were human remains, but she wanted them to belong to an animal. She didn't want to think that she really could have found the body of a little girl that day and literally telling this story is giving me chills because I can just imagine what her head was going through at that time. Part of the reason why I'm talking about Dana's testimony so much is obviously because, you know, the defense wanted to say that she wasn't credible, but also because when we talk about these cases where someone finds a body, we sort of just mention that, you know, this person discovered the body, this is how they discovered it, and then we don't really talk much more about it. But Dana really highlights the shock and the torment that someone can face when they're faced with something like this. That murder does not only just affect the victim and their friends, their family, the community, and everybody who loved them, but the people involved in the case. The person who found the body of an innocent little girl after seeing her alive just days earlier, she happened upon it. She didn't want to find this body. She didn't want to see what she saw, but she did, and there was no choice. There was nothing that she could have done about it. The guilt that she faces and the torment that she must live through every single day is something that people just don't really talk about. I will say that I was very angry and very annoyed when I learned that Dana had found these remains and just didn't do anything about this little girl that she saw and how deep down she knew that these remains belonged to a murdered little girl. But I also feel for her in this situation. I genuinely think that she had some sort of mental block where she knew deep down that these remains belonged to a little girl, but she just did not want to believe it. She saw it and she just thought in her head, no way, this can't be true. This can't be what I saw. It has to be something else. And I know she went home every single day that she saw these remains and was just tortured by this. So that's kind of why I'm talking about this because I do understand that it's frustrating that she didn't say anything, but I also want to understand that she probably was in such a horrible mental state after finding them that she just didn't know what to do. Obviously, the right thing is to report it, and they were eventually reported, and as we know, it did get Rodney caught, and it did put him on trial, so let's just be a little bit kinder towards Dana, as I'm sure a lot of you are just as frustrated as I was when I first read about Dana not doing anything when she initially found the remains. So, now let's get back to the trial. Next in the trial, they discussed Rodney's prior history of sexual assault against Tally Shapiro, Julie Johnson, and Monique Hoyt. 
all of the victims who had gotten away, all of the victims who could come forward and tell their stories and talk about just the kind of man that Rodney was. Other witnesses came forward to say how they had seen Rodney on the beach taking pictures of people on the day that Robin went missing. Then, over 50 young girls testified over the course of a month and a half about Rodney driving up to them, trying to get them to come with him, and when they refused, he would offer them photography sessions, they would offer them weed, and ask them for their phone numbers, and he was relentless. He was persistent when these girls would turn him down. So, once again, it is interesting to see Yes, there were so many of these victims, but we also have to remember that there's probably so many people out there that didn't go with Rodney, that didn't give him the time of day, that didn't fall victim to him because they ran away and they told him no. Then, there were two inmates who had served time with Rodney who came forward to talk about how Rodney actually confessed to them while he was in jail that he killed Robin and he went into detail about how it went down. This inmate testified that he had picked up Robin and offered to drive her to her dance class, but after picking her up, Rodney asked Robin if she had ever posed nude for a picture before, and that is when Robin started crying. So, he slapped the shit out of her, and that is a direct quote. Then, when Robin realized that he wasn't taking her to dance class, she started screaming, so, Rodney bashed her on the head repeatedly. When she became unconscious, the inmate said that Rodney said that at this time, it was when he made the decision to take her up to the mountains. He said that he hit her bike somewhere else and that he knows that nobody saw him on the mountain that day. He said that the cops would never find her bike, nor would anybody ever be able to identify him as being on the mountains that day. Maybe he thought that he intimidated the witness by staring her down or something like that. Maybe he didn't notice that she had driven by. I don't really know, but at this point, he knew for certain that the police would not catch him for the murder. But the prosecution called other inmates as witnesses who said that they knew that these inmates who were telling the story about Rodney were making up the story about him confessing. They said that they bargained with the prosecution to get reduced time off of their original sentencing. They said that they pretty much only discussed information that could be easily found out on the news. The defense also brought brought forward several witnesses who presented evidence that Rodney had either called them or was with them at different points on the night of June 20th, so there's no way that he could have been on those mountains at that time because there's no service on the mountains for him to make phone calls, so obviously he couldn't have been on the mountains if he was making phone calls, and obviously if someone saw him in person, not on the mountains, then that shows that he wasn't there. The jury of nine women and three men left to deliberate on April 20th, 28th, 1980. The jury deliberated until the next day on August 30th when they came back to the judge telling him that they had their verdict. Now, I do want to mention that the charges of lewd or lascivious acts upon a child under 14 had been dropped because apparently they couldn't prove that. However, all of the other charges were still intact. When the jury came back, they found Rodney Akala guilty of first-degree murder and forcible kidnapping of Robin Samso. For this, he was sentenced to death. After this, in September of 1980, Rodney stood trial for the rape and assault of 15-year-old Monique Hoyt. This trial was said to have been very short. He was quickly found guilty for rape, and he was sentenced to nine years for this. By 1984, the Supreme Court in California actually reversed the death penalty for Rodney's conviction. At this point, Rodney's defense had also filed an appeal to the conviction altogether, saying that his past criminal history was wrongly allowed to be presented in court, and this motion was granted by the California Supreme Court as well. They ruled that his past criminal history of luring young girls to his car and raping them does not mean that that is what he did to Robin, which is absolutely crazy to me and makes absolutely no sense because as we know, past criminal history is a good indicator for future criminal history, but either way, the new trial for the kidnap and murder of Robin Samso started on April 23rd, 1986. This time, his case was being prosecuted by Deputy DA Tom Golthals. 
Once again, he used Dana as their star witness. They also used the two inmates that said that he confessed to this murder, as well as other witnesses who could place him at the scene and on the beach when Robin went missing. So basically, they used a lot of the information that they used in the first trial, but this time, they just didn't talk about his past criminal history. Then his defense, John Patrick Dolan stated once again that the prosecution had coerced Dana into making her statement. He also said that the inmates that Rodney allegedly confessed to were not credible. He also said that Rodney was on the beach that day. He wasn't denying that and he said that he was taking pictures and maybe even he took pictures of Robin, but he didn't kill her. Now, in a shocking turn of events, Dana decided that she would not be testifying at this trial due to her mental state. A medical professional did examine her and did rule that she is mentally unfit to testify. However, in another shocking decision, the judge decided that her testimony from the previous trial would be allowed in this trial. So, the prosecution also talked about the earrings that were found in the storage locker that belonged to Rodney, the storage locker belonging to him, and the earrings were said to have been Robin's, and Robin's mother did say that they did belong to Robin. But of course, the defense simply claimed that they were not hers. However, these earrings had been clipped to better fit Robin's ears and Robin's mother was able to supply the clippers that were used to make this modification and the marks on the earrings did match the clippers that she said were used. Therefore, these earrings had to belong to Robin and not Rodney. The defense also brought forward pretty much all of the other same information that they talked about in the first trial. This second trial only lasted for four weeks. On May 24th, 1986, the jury of six men and six women were sent in for their deliberations. They deliberated for four days before they came back with their verdict, once again, they found Rodney Alcala was guilty on counts of murder, kidnapping, and false imprisonment using a deadly weapon. For this, once again, he was sentenced to death. This time, the California Supreme Court did uphold the conviction. During his time in prison, Rodney wrote a book called You, the Jury, where he pled that he's not guilty in Robin's murder. He also made up a bunch of other random stories about other victims, including Monique Hoyt. Basically, he said that he didn't do anything. He was giving all these crazy explanations for what really, what really happened. I chose not to read or entertain it in any capacity because he's lying and I don't care to listen to his bull. So, I'm not going to talk about anything further beyond that with his stupid book. Either way, you are not going to believe this, but by April 2nd, 2001, once again, Rodney's murder conviction was overturned. His new trial was set for the spring of 2005, but it was pushed back ultimately to October of 2005 because his defense attorney had passed away at some point. Now, from the time that this happened to his third trial over the years, California passed a new law that would allow detectives to take DNA from prison inmates and put them into a DNA database to search for matches for unsolved crimes. First, by 2004, Rodney's DNA connected him to the murder of 18-year-old Jill Barcombe. Then, by January of 2005, his DNA was connected to 32-year-old Charlotte Lamb, who was murdered in 1978 and her body was found in the laundry room of that apartment building. Then, he was connected to Jill Parentu, who was murdered in her apartment in Burbank. Then, he was connected to the murder of 27-year-old Georgia Wixted. So, now, Rodney was connected to five murders, including Robin Samso. At this time, the California District Attorney's Office decided that they wanted to put Rodney on trial for these four murders that he was connected to via DNA, now that it looked like he was this heinous and brutal serial killer. The preliminary trial for this started on November 22nd, 2005, and at this point, Rodney was 62 years old. At this time, Rodney actually pled guilty to all four murders. So, the district attorney's office decided to consolidate these four murders with the murder of Robin. This was ultimately granted, and so his trial was moved to May 25th, 2006. Once again, he pled guilty to these four murders, but once this was consolidated to include the fifth, he no longer pled guilty. However, 
things would be delayed time and time again. Rodney took multiple requests and appeals in order to be granted the ability to represent himself at trial. He kept claiming ineffective counsel, but either way, he was granted the ability to represent himself in this third trial. So, this whole process took until September of 2009. Then jury selection started in December of 2009, and this wasn't completed until January of 2010. Then finally, the trial for these five murders started on January 11th, 2010, and once again, Rodney represented himself. So, this time, the prosecution had DNA evidence to rely on to prosecute this case for these four murders. Throughout the trial, Rodney barely contested that he was the one responsible for the four murders. All he had to say about them was that he didn't remember killing them. So, just like with the second trial, Dana did not testify, but they were able to use the statements from Dana from the first trial. The prosecution also used testimony from those other inmates. This time, they were also able to bring up his past criminal history with Monique, Tally, and Julie, as this was a stipulation for him in order to represent himself. In this trial, the prosecution also brought up that shortly after Robin's disappearance, Rodney had cut his hair and then straightened it. Remember, he had wild curly hair, so it was said that this was being done in order to disguise himself so that he wouldn't be matched up in a photo lineup or something like that. So, the prosecution brought this forward as a reason why he was guilty but Rodney called up his then-girlfriend, who testified that she was actually the one who asked him to make these changes in his appearance. Now, I don't know Beth's knowledge of all of these crimes. I don't know if she had any sort of involvement. I doubt she did, but it seemed like she was in sort of denial. She didn't think that he was guilty, so I don't know if it's true that she really told him to make these changes, but she testified that she was the one who asked him to do this. My thought is that maybe Rodney had brought it up to her and then made it feel like it was her idea, like, hey, wouldn't I look good with shorter, straight hair? And she's like, yeah, you should do that. We should see what that looks like, something like that. That's my thought on how that went down because, again, I don't think Beth was involved in any way, but I do think she was in denial and I don't know if she ever, you know, came to and realized that he was guilty or if she just always thought that he was innocent. But either way, throughout this third trial, the only really thing that Rodney focused on was Robin's murder. Again, he didn't really say much about the four others because he basically didn't deny that he was guilty for these ones. But when it comes to Robin's murder, he argued that he was at Knott's Berry Farm that day applying for jobs. Other witnesses at the farm stated that they do remember seeing him there and that they do remember that he was applying for a job, but nobody could pinpoint the exact day that he was there. Then he played the clip of him on the dating game show that showed that he was wearing earrings during that episode. He used this to try and claim that the earrings that were found in his storage locker weren't Robin's, but they were actually his. There were several people who he brought forward that he worked with at the LA Times that testified that he did often wear gold ball earrings. Other people said that they specifically noticed the these earrings because at the time, men never wore earrings, so it was sort of quirky and out there for him to be wearing these earrings. There was one time at this trial where Rodney called himself as a witness. He would ask himself a question and then go sit down on the witness stand and answer his own question. He would use one voice for him being his defense attorney and then he would use another voice when he was Rodney himself. It was really weird. But either way, during his testimony, he talked about every single day in June in very great detail. From the 1st to the 19th, he explained every single day in excruciating detail, including every single phone call he made, everywhere he went, everything that he did, everyone he interacted with. But then when it came to June 20th, the day that Robin was kidnapped, all he did was summarize. He said, well, I went to Knott's Berry Farm to apply for this job. Then I got ready for a date with my girlfriend and that's it. Overall, this testimony lasted for five hours. Just imagine five hours of him talking to himself, asking himself questions, changing his voices, all of that for five hours. 
my heart goes out to the jury because they had to sit through that entire thing of him just talking to himself. Making an entire show out of this entire trial, it's absolutely ridiculous. The prosecution's closing statements focused on the fact that he committed these crimes all with premeditation, with deliberation, there was DNA to prove connections to four of the victims, and there were witnesses to show that he was there all of which could prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. He's got no soul or feelings. These are first degree murders. When you're talking about a guy like that, who is hunting through Southern California, looking for people to kill because he enjoys it, he gets off on the infliction of, other, of pain on other people. So there isn't a single witness that puts Rodney Alcala at knots after three o'clock, except for Rodney Alcala. He put new carpeting in his car. Who does that? And he said he spilled gas in there, okay. Who does that? In his closing statements, Rodney basically said that all of the evidence that the prosecution has against him, they're all gimmicks and lies. Basically, what Rodney did was he would scope out these young girls and young women. He would find out where they live, it seems like. He would try to interact with them, try to find some way to get them to come with him or get them to let him into his home. Then he would strangle them, he would beat them, and rape them. By February 23rd, the jury finally went into deliberation. By February 25th, they came back with their decision. Rodney Akala was found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of five counts of first-degree murder and one count of kidnapping. Then they read that the jury found true of five special circumstance allegations, including torture, rape, kidnapping, and multiple murder. When this verdict was being read, Rodney showed absolutely no emotion. In the penalty phase, the prosecution brought forward a surprise witness, Tally Shapiro. She was now all grown up and she spoke with confidence about all of the things that Rodney did to her when she was just an eight-year-old little girl. She said that she still suffers with difficulty in trusting anybody that she meets, so this leaves her with being alone all of the time. Obviously, this attack left her with permanent, permanent physical and emotional scars that she will never be able to get over. Then, of course, the different family members of all of the victims talked about just how destroyed their families are now because of Rodney's actions, especially Robin's parents. They were absolutely horrified. They said that they will never be the same. They will never recover from their little girl being taken from them. The only person that Rodney called to the stand during the penalty phase was a psychiatrist that he hired. This psychiatrist diagnosed Rodney with borderline personality disorder. The psychiatrist said that this is probably the reason that Rodney doesn't remember the four killings. The prosecution argued that the only thing that Rodney deserves is to be sentenced to the same fate that he gave his victims. When Rodney was asked if he wanted to give a statement, he said, quote, by giving me the death penalty, you become a wannabe killer in waiting. The jury went into their deliberations and once again, he was sentenced to death. After this whole mess of trials and convictions and things being overturned, there was still more to do. The Huntington Beach Police released over 100 photos of young women and children that were found in Rodney's storage locker. They don't know if these photos are of more victims, but they want the public's help in identifying these individuals. Rodney could be connected to four more murders in the area, and some people think that it could be even more. I've heard numbers as high as 160, but I don't personally believe that it's that many, but I do think that it could be a lot more than the seven that we know of. We don't know if the people in these photos are people who were willingly pictured or if they are victims. I will leave a link down below that has all of the photos for you to look at to see if you can identify anybody in these photos. Of course, it would probably be too much to include all 100 photos in this video, so the rest of the ones that I'm not able to include will be linked down below. Some of them are thought to be of one of the women that we discussed in this video. Some of them are completely random and we don't know if they belong to a victim.
By 2012, Rodney was extradited from California back to New York after being indicted for the 1977 murder of Alan Jane Hoover and the 1971 murder of Cornelia Crilly. He pled guilty to these murders by 2013, and he was sentenced to 25 years behind bars. Then, in 2006, prosecutors in Wyoming actually charged Rodney with the murder of a 28-year-old woman named Christine Ruth Thornton, who went missing in 1978 and whose body was found in 1982, and she was six months pregnant when she was murdered. But I guess these charges were ultimately dismissed. I saw that they were dismissed, but I don't know any more information about if he was connected, how he was connected. So I am just mentioning her just in case if there is ever more information that comes forward to show that he's connected to her. But for now, these charges were dismissed. Then by July 24th, 2021, by 1.43 a.m. at the age of 77 years old, Rodney Akala died of natural causes while he was awaiting his death sentence. Of course, his death left the families of his victims with a lot of relief and joy. The man who had murdered their loved ones put especially Robin's family through all of these freaking trials and this whole spectacle of things and all of this stress this man was finally gone. In a Facebook post, Robin's sister Terrence said that his death is the best birthday present that they can imagine for their mother, Mary Ann, who died back in 2019. She wrote, quote, "'Today we received the best news ever. Alcala died. I know my mom is dancing up in heaven. He can't appeal this one. My sister can finally rest in heaven, literally now. And I can definitely understand the sense of relief that they probably felt after dealing with everything that they had to deal with because of Rodney. At the end of this case, we're still left with so many questions in my opinion. I did try to find out if Rodney ever came forward explaining why he did what he did, but I couldn't find anything specific. If you guys know of anything that he's written or anything else where he said, why he did what he did other than that book where he's just basically lying the whole time. But if you know of anything else that I didn't mention, please let me know in the comments below. But otherwise, I don't know why he was so hellbent on denying Robin's murder, but he was okay with admitting to the other ones. My thought is maybe that he knew that murdering a little girl would look a lot worse to other prison inmates than murdering a grown woman, but I don't really know. I feel like murdering women, young women, teenagers, girls. It's all horrible. It's all horrible. I feel like maybe he knew that the DNA connected him to the other victims from the very beginning, and he knew that maybe there was no DNA connecting him to Robin, so he thought that if he denied it enough that maybe he'd get away with that one. I genuinely don't know. But clearly, Rodney is just a very sick person who has this deep, deep hatred for any women and girls that he comes into contact with. He felt entitled to them. And the fact that he was able to get away with it for so long is just sickening and terrifying. The fact that he went in front of so many judges that he knew that knew about his past criminal history that knew that he just kept doing the same thing over and over and over again and just kept letting him out it's atrocious it's disgusting it's despicable and i have no idea how that happens i don't know how certain judges sleep at night knowing that they released a disgusting predator who again it's one thing that he was released after Tally, which I will get more into in just a minute, but the fact that he did it to Tally, and then he did it to Julie, and then he did it to Monique, and then he still, still let out is just crazy to me, and it's so, so, so ridiculous. The fact that he was looked at at all of these other murders as suspects, but they just couldn't connect him yet, all of that together, and he was still being released. So, there were people out there who knew that he was murdering people, they just couldn't prove it yet but they also knew and they could prove that he had raped three women. So the fact that he was able to keep doing this is just crazy to me. If he had just been in jail for the brutal attack on Tally like he should have been, then 
all of the other murders could have been prevented. Someone doesn't just attack an eight-year-old little girl to the very edge of death and just stop with that behavior. I genuinely believe that Rodney had full intentions of killing her and the only reason that he didn't is because he wasn't able to because this amazing good Samaritan followed his instincts and called the police when he saw something that looked off. He truly saved Tali's life. But the fact that just because she wasn't there to testify, the fact that just because her family couldn't say how this impacted them, clearly it impacted them to the point where they felt the need to move out of the country. We have these other officers who found her body in the condition that it was in. Apparently that wasn't enough to get anything more than a year in jail or a year sentence. This wasn't enough for the police to come forward and say, look, this man beat this little girl. He beat her with a steel pipe and he raped her. He didn't just molest her, which I don't know why that's a smaller word or deserving of a lesser sentence, but that's not all he did. He beat this girl almost to death. And the fact that the courts just, I guess, didn't think that it was enough for the police who found her body to come forward with what they knew is ridiculous. He should have been charged with attempted murder and rape and he should have been inside of a jail cell and just left there because again, someone who does this against a child, they are not going to stop. I'm sorry if this sounds very harsh, but anybody who has that disgusting part of them that thinks that it's okay to hurt a child and to sexually abuse and rape a child, anybody who has that heart, anybody who has that within them should never see the light of day ever again. They should be inside of a jail cell for their entire life. If you molest somebody, you're going to keep doing it once you're out of jail. I don't care how much treatment this person goes through. That person has those urges and they are never going to go away. And I'm sorry if some of you don't agree with me. I'm sorry if you think that there is rehabilitation, but when it comes to children, in my real life, I see so much that children go through. I work with children who've been abused, who have disabilities on a regular basis, and the things that they go through, no, it's never going to change. Their lives matter so, so, so much more, exponentially more than people who harm children. It's just crazy that this case happened so long ago and time and time again, 40 years later, it still happens that judges and courts will look at these disgusting predators and think, hmm, a year in jail, they're gonna stop nothing else. Oh, wait, they, they were released and then they did it again four more times. Okay, another year in jail. They'll stop. They'll stop this time. Oh, we found all this stuff in their house and, and it's proven that they haven't stopped and that they did it again and again and again. Oh, another year in jail. They'll be fine. It's just crazy that this still happens 40 years later, that the justice system cares more about releasing these predators than they do about protecting the children. These men continue to be let out and all they learn all that this teaches people when they rape someone or molest someone or beat someone is that the only thing that they did wrong was letting this person go because that's why they got caught. So when you let these people out time and time again after beating or raping someone, they're just going to start killing them. And that's clear. We see that. We see that pattern because again, they know that these victims can come forward with their information, they can come forward to the courts, they can get them in trouble. So the only thing that they can think of to do to prevent that is to kill them. So the fact that this keeps happening, the fact that we see these patterns, the fact that, you know, one person can be responsible for so many horrific things and still be let out of jail is just horrendous to me. I'm sure that you guys are all just as angry as I am that all of these women and children's lives were taken from them, but that is where I want to leave that. I am happy that Rodney is dead and gone. I'll say that because he can't pull any more antics. He can't try spreading lies. He can't hurt anybody else. He can no longer sit there and think, poor me anymore because he's gone and the victims and their families can finally be at peace that he's gone. So again, I know I got harsh at the end of this video, but people like him, they do not deserve to see the outside of a jail cell ever after committing their first crime against a child because they are not going to stop. I know that I got harsh at the end of this video and I normally, I will say I get fired up about half the time of these videos and this honestly is why I don't typically cover cases involving children because it makes me so angry, because I see children on a daily basis that are suffering from the consequences of disgusting adults who don't know how to take care of children and who abuse them and who hurt them and so 
going through these emotions while going through a case definitely does take a toll on me, so that's why I don't cover these cases all the time, but I definitely still wanted this case to be covered because I don't think that this situation is known as much as so many others and so many women and so many children and teenagers lost their lives or are left with permanent scars due to the actions of this man. So I definitely wanted to go ahead and talk about this case with you guys. But with that, that is where I am going to end this video. Thank you all so much for sticking with me through this horrific case and for sticking with me through all of these videos in Creep Week, which turned out to be Creep Weeks, two Creep Weeks. But either way, if you liked this video and you want to see more videos like this in the future and you like part two videos or you like serial killer cases, please go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and let me know down below. Are you guys enjoying these two-part series? Do you want me to find more condensed cases to put into one video? Or do you really like these deep dives like we did this week and last week? Please let me know down below any thoughts that you have. With that, make sure you go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and use my link down below or scan the QR code here to get 65% off of your Babbel subscription and start learning a new language in just three weeks. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!